Welcome to Remembering When's Salute to the American Worker, who through years of hard labor, ingenuity, guts, and stamina, not only brought glory and stature to this country, but also a better way of life. We begin with a 1950 expose on how we actually got all that we have. What makes it tick? And what we want to do with it? Let's start with you and what you want. What does anybody want? Do you think you're different from other people? Millions have worshipped the strong man, the leader. Millions let somebody else decide what they want. They worked, fought, died for government by strong men, by fear, by force. Yeah, the dictator. No, not everybody agrees. Over here, we don't like dictators. We don't worship the strong man. We worship as we please. Our government represents us, the people. Our government is our servant, not our master. We can work, we can fight too. The government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Any government has a lot of power, but keep in mind that the power can come from the top down or from the bottom up. And it makes a lot of difference to you, what you can do and what you can't do, where and how you live and work. Let's start from there. One worker out of five lives close to the land on our six million farms and ranches. Four workers out of five work away from the land in almost four million other places. What helped us get what we have? Let's start at the beginning. The founders of the country didn't have tractors or television sets or automobiles, but they did have a mighty faith in God and a big revolutionary idea about people. They thought governments ought to be the servant, not the master of ordinary people like you and me. The signers of the Declaration of Independence declared their belief that we are endowed by our Creator with rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which nobody, no person, no group, no political party, not even our government, can take away from us. This farmer has certain unalienable rights. This worker has the same rights, responsibilities, and obligations, which are his birthright under the law. We have half the productive power on Earth. That didn't just happen. There's a good reason why we have the best workers, the fools on Earth. Why we're about eight to one better off than the rest of the whole world. How do you think this came to be? What makes us tick? Tom! Tom, what do you want for breakfast? I can't hear you! Never mind. While she gets Tom's breakfast, let's take a closer look at that pan. The iron ore for that pan came from the Masabi Range. So let's start there and see what happened. Maybe it'll give us an idea of just what it is we have. Nature put the iron ore there, but it wasn't worth anything until men came along. Men with tools. These are the best workmen and the best tools on Earth. You can't make a pan only with iron ore. You need coal. You need other raw materials. Limestone must be quarried. It takes a lot of know-how to make iron and steel. Coal must be reduced to coke before it can be used. It takes all of this and more just to produce the basic steel. This is what men can do if you give them a chance. Give them economic freedom. Economic freedom in this country means that you and everybody else is free to work to make things, to produce. That's one part of it. You're free to buy and sell, to make a profit or a loss. That's the second part. And you're free to save and to invest in more and better tools. That's the third part. And it all adds up to the great gift of economic freedom. Keep it in mind 
as you watch these men and their tools. Now, one of the many unique and ingenious items American workers have given us over the years was a little thing known as the cash register. This 1952 NCR, National Cash Register Company, love letter to the device explains all the little intricacies that went into those pre-electronic models. I just wanted to work here. Starting some 40 years before that, with 13 employees, this company had taken a crude idea and developed it into the most widely used machine in the handling of money and records in the whole world. I've seen some of those early models since and heard some fantastic stories about them. When the first cash registers came out, some people were suspicious of them. They took the new machines to be a challenge to their honesty, instead of a faster, more accurate way of keeping track of sales. Fortunately, this opposition didn't last long, but there just at first, some of the rougher element tried to run cash register men out of town. And in those days, it took a brave man to be an NCR salesman. Here will do. Mr. Purdy, I'm from the National Cash Register Company of Dayton, Ohio. This is a three key sample model. Hmm. Here was a company that had gone at it from an entirely new angle. It set out to improve the conditions under which the product was made. Not only for the sake of the product, but for the sake of the workers too. They were given the first daylight factory. The walls were made 80% glass. The first welfare department for employees was established, which has been the model for industrial relations ever since. The first inside the plant dining room for the workers that has today grown into nine different dining rooms, not counting the main auditorium where the workers can take their lunches and watch a movie while they eat. It is a common saying around Dayton, you don't have to carry lunch buckets to NCR. You get a home-cooked meal in the middle of the day, just like home. And a choice of pleasant surroundings where the folks can eat together and talk over problems or just have fun. The first factory medical section with free company doctor and nurses in attendance. Sick benefits, group insurance, and so forth. Some of these ideas came from the employees themselves. The skilled hands that put together up to 20,000 parts in a single machine. Many of them not only more intricate, but more precise than the works of the finest watch. They have to be. They have to work longer and harder. They can't ever be almost right. They have to be exactly right, each time, every time, all the time. Everything we do ends up in figures. Figures on wheels. Big wheels, little wheels, round wheels, and decagonal. Figures on tabs and indicators, round, square, flat, and rectangular. Figures stamped on, rolled on, and painted on through silk. Figures black on white and white on black. Figures that are every color of the rainbow. Figures that pop up, spin around, and march up and down and sideways to infinity. In whatever way our lives are touched by the business world, business machines, largely national machines, speed up the millions of transactions. Take shopping. There would be no giant supermarkets as we know them today were it not for the fast, all-duty checkout machines developed by NCR. Suppose some weird, impossible calamity struck us, the way they do it in science fiction. And suddenly, every national checkout register in the world would vanish into thin air. Can you imagine what would happen? I hope you won't mind waiting. What's the matter up there? She's slow today. That'll be 479. Oh, just a minute. I forgot the tax. And then, when we call off the evil eye. Yes, where would we be without the cash register? Now, one thing we picked out of that piece was the in-house cafeteria. Now, there's a business practice that has gone the way of the dinosaur. Nowadays, you either bring your lunch or go out. No more just heading downstairs to the cafeteria. 
but you might have a vending machine or two around the office or plant. This 1959 film from the Vendo Company shows off some of the vending machines their workers used to produce, especially for a well-known soda company. Wherever you go throughout America today, you will find an inviting new look in structures of every kind and whole new business districts shopping centers with a flair for the dramatic in their architecture. They are bold and beautiful, frequently horizontal, and creditable attachments to the surrounding greenery. Outside, as well as inside, the buildings of business and industry reflect the concern of today's management with appearance. And it's strictly the profit motive. Workers work better enjoy their jobs more when the appearance of the plant is more attractive. As much consideration is given to the style and design of new service stations as is given to the style and design of new automobiles. American industry spends more than $500 million a year in styling and designing new products as well as improving the impact of well-established products. Tops in the business is Claire Hodgman of the industrial design firm Hodgman Burke in New York. The purpose of any design is to increase the sales appeal, the merchandising oomph, and you do this in two ways, by increasing the efficiency of the product and by increasing the beauty. You can see at a glance what I mean in this new line of Coca-Cola coolers being manufactured by the Vendo Company. The million dollar line. It takes years of research and testing to develop trouble-free, dependable coolers. Here was developed and continually improved the basic revolving disc principle of the veteran V23, the Vendo V44, likewise still to be manufactured and for the same reason. It's a prize location getter. There's a mountain of blueprints for every new model specifications for tools and dies from engineering design before the tremendous punch presses can stamp out the shelves for the new Vendo V92 single drink machines. Welding the new V92 multi-drink machines involves the same sturdy precision welding given every other model in the line. Cabinets welded in so many places they can't conceivably get out of shape even when they're twisted. The new V144, like every other model, has a bonderized cabinet with a durable baked enamel finish that retains all of its original luster and eye appeal. The new V90 Malted Drink is assured the dependable long life of the Vendo refrigeration unit, heart of the machine. The new V216 single drink receives the electrical harness, nerve center of the machine. The new V144 multi drink receives the thick fiberglass insulation in door and cabinet. Efficiency and low operating cost packed inside each machine. Here they are, model after exciting model on the final assembly line. The refreshing look becomes a reality. The refreshing look in the million dollar line of new Vendo coolers, exclusively built for Coca-Cola, joins the inviting new look that makes American life more pleasurable as well as more practical. There's good selling for dealers as well as salesmen in the selling year ahead, with new merchandising impact everywhere in the exciting festival of the American marketplace. Notice something that is missing from today's soda vending machines? That bottle cap opener on the front of the machine. Everything is twist top now. All right, time for a short break, but stay tuned for a full color look at how the Unisphere, the symbol of the New York World's Fair of 1964 was built. Stay tuned. Many remember all the hubbub around the 1964 World's Fair, which was held in New York. This 1964 film shows how the symbol of the event, the Unisphere, was created. 1939, 
the New York World's Fair. 1904, the St. Louis Fair. 1889, the Paris International Exposition. From earliest times, markets and fairs have been a gathering place where men came not only to trade, but to exchange ideas. As civilizations grew, as communications improved between nations, peoples of the world looked for new ways to display their industrial and cultural accomplishments. With the coming of the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Fair was born. London, 1851. Over this world of squatting stones and twisting streets arose a strange and unbelievable structure, the Crystal Palace. It was built for and became the symbol of the London Exposition of 1851, the first World's Fair. In 1889, there arose over Paris the theme symbol of the Paris International Exposition, the Eiffel Tower. Then one day in March 1963, notables of both France and the United States gathered at Flushing Meadows, New York, for the beginning of construction of Unisphere, theme symbol for a new World's Fair. Unisphere, the largest representation of our globe ever attempted. Unisphere, the largest stainless steel structure yet built. Perched atop a sculptured base, which must suggest lightness and grace, Unisphere would have to withstand the enormous and changing forces of the wind, as well as its own weight. The continents and islands would act like sails, and wind pressure could exert forces nearly equal to the weight of the entire structure. Because Unisphere is open and its land area is irregular in size and position, the wind blows on either the outside or the inside, the front of a continent or its back. Unisphere had to be completed by April 1964. High-speed computers were used to solve the thousands of problems that would have taken years if attempted manually. Design analyzed and approved, fabrication and construction could begin. Thousands of different pieces had to be cut, formed, assembled, and welded. Land areas were fabricated and assembled on this turtle-shaped fitting table, which duplicated the exact curvature of Unisphere. Wrapped to protect the stainless beauty, Sections were shipped by rail and highway to Unisphere's site. 30 USS T-1 steel anchor bolts are set and the concrete base poured around them. First structural member to go into place is the South Pole. Next, one of Unisphere's largest members, a lower meridian, is carefully fitted into the South Pole and laid across the pedestal. Actually welded girders, the lower meridians will support the entire structure. Many of the members are field welded into sub-assemblies nicknamed orange peel sections. Now, addition of the land areas can begin. Continents and islands in place, it remains only to raise the three orbit rings. Weighing three tons each, the orbit rings are field welded into a continuous single piece 450 feet around. An intricate communication plan and network links all hands. About 50 stainless steel guy wires connect each ring to Unisphere, just as spokes tie a bicycle wheel rim to its axle. Only 162 days after construction was begun, Unisphere is complete. Its challenge successfully met. A spectacular piece of open stainless steel sculpture, Unisphere is dedicated to man's aspirations towards peace through mutual understanding and symbolizes his achievements in an expanding universe. And it would appear those who worked on and designed the Unisphere did a pretty good job because it is still standing today in Flushing Meadows, New York, where it was built, as you can see from this 2010 photo. Good old American know-how. Well, continuing on and backing up a few years to 1937, let's take a look at how all that information you read in your local newspaper actually gets to the printed page, starting with where the paper it is printed on comes from. Before tomorrow's Chicago Tribune can be printed, there must be paper. And to make paper, there must be trees. 
Now the streams leap and roar, and the great harvest of logs cut in the winter and piled on the ice continues its journey from the forest to Shelter Bay. Ships are loaded and push off for the Tribune paper mill at Thorold at the western end of Lake Ontario. The logs are lifted from the hold by derricks. Then they're picked up by a chain conveyor and stacked in mountainous piles containing as much as 100,000 cords of wood. At a transfer junction, the logs go on to another conveyor that carries them to rotating washing drums. Newsprint used by the Tribune consists of approximately 25% chemical pulp and 75% mechanical pulp. Mechanical pulp gives paper the porous-like characteristics that enable it to absorb ink on high-speed newspaper presses. Chemical pulp gives it strength and flexibility. The pulps are then beaten together, more water is added, and the mixture is pumped into the paper-making machine where it flows onto wire screens that form an endless belt. When the paper leaves the screens, it passes between two large rollers that squeeze out still more water. Then it goes through another series of rollers that squeeze and dry it further. The final touch is given by steel calendar rollers that polish the paper and give it a smoother finish. Next, it is rewound on steel spindles and wrapped in extra heavy paper. Paper has been made from trees. The next step is to transport it from the paper mill to Tribune Tower. Into the hold of one of the Tribune's fleet of ships go the rolls of paper. Then across Lakes Erie, St. Clair, Huron, and Michigan, moves the parade of paper to Tribune warehouses near the mouth of the Chicago River. Here at the Tribune's own dock, the ships tie up and the rolls of paper are lifted from the hold to conveyors that take them in swift procession to the warehouses. Founded in 1847, the Tribune is Chicago's oldest newspaper. Within Tribune Tower, the staff goes about the daily business of producing a newspaper. Across the city desk passes the news of metropolitan Chicago. Over this department presides the city editor, directing his forces so that the news of the day will be accurately reported, interestingly presented. From the press associations and hundreds of Tribune correspondents comes the news of the country by telegraph to be handled here. A similar desk is in charge of the cable editor, to whom comes news from outside the United States. Under the direction of the sports editor are experts who write the story of baseball and football, of golf and tennis, of horse racing and boxing, and all the other recreational activities of this sports-loving nation. Still another important department is that of finance and business. On all topics of special interest, writers keep Tribune readers well informed. Whatever is worthwhile in the arts and sciences is interestingly reported by trained observers. And supervising these various men and women, each trained in his or her special field, are the assistant editor-in-chief and the managing editor, who coordinate their output into one harmonious whole. Long ago, the Tribune realized the value of pictures in bringing people and events vividly and unforgettably to its readers. And so every day, scores of pictures are printed, some of them supplied by photographic services, some taken on the scene by Tribune photographers. To make the engravings from which Tribune illustrations are printed, the pictures to be reproduced, whether drawings or photographs, are placed before a camera in the engraving room. The shutter is snapped, and the image is recorded on a sensitized negative glass plate. The light from a flaming arc transfers the image to the zinc plate. After it has been powdered with dragon's blood and heated, the zinc plate is etched in an acid bath. Removed from the bath, the plate is washed and goes to the router, a man with a sure eye and a steady hand who cuts away excess metal. It is then mounted on a metal base. Now the engraving of the cartoon or strip or photograph is ready for proofing in order that the artist, the editors, the engravers, and all others concerned may inspect the finished product. Phew! Putting on a newspaper is almost as dizzying as some of the stories on the pages they print. All right, time to wrap things up, and what better way to finish a salute to the American worker than to give you some advice from 60 years ago that is still pretty pertinent today. Pay attention and learn how to keep a job. Looks all right. Tell me, why are you interested in this job? I need a steady job, Mr. Wiley, with a chance to go places. Now, this one job you had with the uh, Central Distributing Company, you worked there for 18 months? Yes, sir. Why did you leave? Because I wasn't getting anywhere. After 18 months, I figured I was worth more than they were paying me. Were you fired? 
Yes, I was. But it wasn't my fault. The company just up and started firing people. Retrenching, they called it. I think it's a pretty normal situation. A business has to live within its income. Many factors affect that income. Sales, general economic conditions, the development of new industries that replace old ones. For these and many other reasons, businesses often go through periods of adjustment and reorganization when they're forced to let people go. I didn't do anything. Why me? What did I do? Do you expect me to answer that? No, sir. I guess you wouldn't know. Actually, I probably do know better than you do. Let me give you a picture of a case I really do know. It's about a young man who came to work in our shipping room here. Now, we begin work here at 8.30. And that's the time Bob Anderson began work every day. We could depend on him to be on time and to do his work on time. Dependability is one of the main keys to keeping a job and getting ahead. The other fellow I want to tell you about is Walter, Bob's brother, Bob's twin brother. But the resemblance is only skin deep. Look at Walter from the employer's point of view, and you see how not to keep a job. Walter finally decides to go to work, but a job he was supposed to do first thing. This is how not to be dependable. How not to cooperate with the company and with your fellow workers. Now, it isn't hard to learn to make good, clean copies on a duplicating machine. And this wasn't the first time I'd had to criticize Walter for making poor copies. The fact was, Walter just couldn't take criticism. Yet, how can a man expect to improve on a job if he won't listen to the very people who can help him? Just before closing time, you'll find Bob getting the shipping room ready for the night. And you'll find Walter getting himself ready. So he won't be a second late punching the clock. An employer sees this as a sure sign that a man isn't really interested in his work. I ask you, if you were the employer and had to cut down your staff, which fellow would you keep? That's not hard to answer. But why didn't you go ahead and fire this, uh, Walter? Now, don't be too hasty. I'm only telling you about Walter's bad point. He did enough work to hang on to his job. As long as times are good, there'll be jobs for fellows who just barely do enough to get by. But to keep a job when the going gets rough, you need to ensure your job. Make yourself so valuable your employer can't let you go.